Good morning, everyone. Thank y'all for attending uh, church with us today. Um, starting out, we have some announcements today. Uh, some pretty big announcements uh, coming up. Um, first of all, we'd like to invite uh, our online audience, uh, anyone watching today, to uh, join us here at Richard Grace Church. Uh, we're presently located at the Old Eden Mall, if you're familiar with that. Um, if not, it's 201 East Meadow Road. Uh, we're right through the main entrance uh, of the mall. Uh, it's now known as the Eden Business Center, so you'll see a sign at the road for that. Um, just come through the main entrance. Uh, we'll have Sunday school at 10 a.m., and we'll have preaching uh, at 11 a.m., the main service. Um, here, we'll be teaching uh, Dr. Rightly about it, and our mission is to enrich and edify in Jesus' name. Um, so, we have a website uh, that you can also see what we're about, uh, our church, our location. Uh, we have devotionals and a bunch of um, devotional material for your spiritual life uh, on there. It's enrichinggrace.com. Um, and if you'd like to support the ministry financially in any way, uh, we are a 501c3 uh, nonprofit, and we can provide receipts uh, if need be for taxes. Um, our PO box is uh, PO box 174, and the zip code is 27289. So, uh, some announcements that we have coming up, uh, for one thing that we're very excited for, is Riverfest. Uh, we'll be having a booth, actually, uh, right beside uh, Mr. Bullings, um, it's looking like right now, so we're very excited about that, to be able to minister to the community in that way, uh, and to meet with people. Um, a few other things that I want to note, recently I had a call from, uh, I've mentioned him a few times, and if he's watching, uh, Ty William. Uh, in India, uh, I've had some calls with him recently, and uh, for one thing, they're going to be starting a Bible school in India um, for evangelists in that area, and we at Richard Grace will be developed, helping him develop some curriculum uh, to help uh, grow these, these uh, ministers in India as they go up and down the uh, east coast of India and ministering to people. Um, if anyone's interested in supporting their ministry, uh, they're in need of supplies. Uh, specifically Bibles in their language. Uh, as these men go out uh, from this uh, Bible school and as they go into the community, uh, that's a barrier over there is having the Bible. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have it in English, um, but with varying languages over there, it's hard to get the Bible in their own language. So if you'll be interested in supporting that ministry, uh, reach out to me and I'll point you in the right direction. Um, also, I uh, look forward to having William speak with us here soon. I'll have a projector up, and we'll actually have India speaking from India. Um, William will be set, setting up a date for that here soon, as uh, we've discussed. Um, we recently got a banner uh, from Riverfest that we're excited, and we'll have it on the road each Sunday for you to see where we're at as well. Um, some things uh, for the church I'd like to set up is some dates for some community outreach events um, to where we can go and minister to the community. Uh, in various ways, um, so we'll probably discuss that at the end of today's service. Um, lastly, once again, I'd like to point you to the site and some devotional materials. Um, I have exciting news uh, with that. I tallied today, and we are having an impact in other countries. I'm, I'm excited to announce. Um, I did the numbers today, and we've ministered to 97 different countries. Um, and honestly, that's very exciting as a church. Uh, that we're able to um, share the gospel uh, with people where the gospel is allowed to be preached. And there's some places I've noticed where in countries that it's not allowed to be preached. Um, so we're doing a good work here, and I'd like to encourage you to keep on, keep on. Uh, so reach out if y'all would like to participate in our online ministry uh, or our physical ministry. Uh, I'm always taking takers. So. Uh, now, today's lesson, uh, this is our fourth in our series, Comfort One Another in Hope. We're journeying through the book of Thessalonians, uh, and while, we, as we've discussed this before, we're talking about how to comfort others, and how God comforts us. Now, today we've landed in uh, chapter 4, and uh, today we've landed in chapter 4 of Thessalonians, and we're going to read through it and uh, break down some of the key concepts here. Um, to review our past three sermons, our first sermon was means of comforting people. We discussed how uh, the Apostle Paul had blessed people in Jesus' name, that he affirmed them, and he showed his appreciation 
to the good work that they was having, although they were being persecuted. Um, secondly, we went into our conduct as Christians as we go out and we minister to the community. Uh, how we, we are to live holy, justly, and unblameably. In our third sermon, and we talked about the obstacles that arise when you go out and you minister in Jesus' name. Um, we talked about how uh, God, even though we have pain, He uh, uses it for His purpose, and something good comes of it. Today is pretty interesting. We're actually going to be talking about all three of these topics. And in a way, because here in chapter 4, it takes these three topics and uh, kind of gives a what now, kind of gives the practicals to it. Um, so before we start, I'd like to pray and then we'll begin. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day, Father. I thank you for the opportunity to be here, Father. Um, I thank you uh, that the weather is clearing up, Father, but we also thank you for the weather. Uh, uh, we always need the rain, Father, and uh, we pray that um, it helps things grow, helps farmers, Father, and uh, whatever else good comes up, Father, you know. I just ask that you watch over uh, our service today, Father, but also as we go out into the week, Father. Um, and we thank you. We won't fail to give you the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, today uh, I want to start off with a brief science lesson. Okay? Um, does anybody know the, the term, the scientific term for walking? You would think walking is a scientific term. Ambulation, isn't it? Ambulating. Ambulation, okay. That, that is one of them. Uh, good job, Hallie. Learn something in college. Here we go. Uh, there's also another one. The general term for walking, which ambulation falls under that, is gait. Sometimes you, uh, if you go to a physical therapist, they'll examine your gait. Gait is important for physical therapists and different kinds of uh, medical practices because how you walk matters. We walk a lot in our lives. It's how we get from one place to another. Um, we drive a lot, but you couldn't drive if you didn't walk to your car in the morning. So imagine how much damage we could have if we're walking incorrectly. And yes, you can walk incorrectly. Walking incorrectly causes a few things, and this is just a, a brief list, but there's a lot more. You could have bad balance, you could get arthritis, Weak muscles, uh, the muscles you don't use. You can have uh, arch problems in your feet, and you could have tendonitis, depending on how you walk. Some examples of it, if you was to walk on your toes, you would build some muscles, but not activate other muscles. If you was to walk on your heels, you would tear up those tendons in your ankles. How you walk matters. I thought it was interesting, I'm pretty sure it's in Africa, there's actually a, a tribe that walks on all fours. And they have for hundreds of years. The reason being is because originally that's how they were taught. And just so on and so on, there was some uh, adaptation. Y'all can look it up, it's really interesting. They didn't learn how to walk correctly, and their body morphed around that. So how we walk matters. Paul knew something about this. And uh, as we'll discuss today, Jesus calls us to use correct form. In the Bible, uh, we're told to walk in a number of ways. We're told to walk worthy. We're told to walk in the light. Uh, in the morning, if you wake up to go get some water and you have some stairs and you don't have that light, what happens? More than likely, you'll fall down the stairs. <laughs> uh, you can walk in truth. We're told to walk in love. We're told to walk by faith. Don't walk by faith downstairs. Right? <laughs> Our walking form matters. Now, we've discussed posture for the uh, past three weeks. We've talked how to keep our spiritual back straight and our shoulders high. Now, we're going to talk about form and our healthy walk. One more thing that I just discussed before we get into this. In metalworking, there is a process that we refine impurities from metal. The process of eliminating impurities is called equation. You have two combined metals. You put this ore in this big bucket and you heat it up. And the nicer metal usually melts first, leaving behind the bad impurities. I want you all to keep this in mind as we're talking today uh, and refining things. Often the impurities have a higher melting point and they just scrape out the, the bad stuff and leave you with things that we enjoy and love, like gold, 
which is used for necklaces, or they found silver, which we also use for jewelry or whatever we use for. The Christian lifestyle works much in the same way in refining. When the heat's turned up, some things are to be left behind. So going into this, we're going to read the uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, and we're going to stop at some of the key points um, after we read, okay? So furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you received of us how ye ought to walk, and we're going to talk about walking, and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any way, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God has not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, and despiseth not God, but God who hath given us unto all, given unto his Holy Spirit. Thus touching brotherly love, I have this verse written up on the board. As touching brotherly love, love ye need, uh, love ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do that towards all, all the brethren which are in Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your hands as we commanded you. Here we go again about walking. That ye may walk honestly towards them which are without, that ye may have lack of nothing. But I will not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Christ died and rose again, there is the gospel, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will bring God with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air, so we shall ever be with the Lord. Here we go. Wherefore, Comfort one another with these words. So, as Christians, our conduct is important as we comfort others. Comforting people, uh, comforting people, are comforted people. The Greek word. Uh, so, let's go to First Thessalonians four, one it says. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. That as you received of us how you ought to walk and please God, so you would abound more and more. That word there, abound, means abundance or overflow. Comforting others is a matter of having uh, an overflow of comfort ourselves. As we're comfort, we're allowed to distribute uh, that comfort to others, uh, to reach out and help you. God justified us. He made us right with him and set us apart to live these lives of honor and were set apart for his purpose. Now, we go down to that uh, verse four, uh, 4. It says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Um, as we're getting started here, I want to define some of these words. That word possess, it mean, uh, the word often when it's used means to win something. It's telling us to win your vessel. Now, what does this mean? There's some contrast here. First of all, as uh, you go down just a little bit farther, it says not to walk in uncleanliness, but in holiness. The Bible is full of contrast. Uh, it'll talk about something evil, and then it'll talk about it's overcome with good. So we have uncleanliness versus holiness. We have the old man or woman versus the new man. We have the old Adam versus the new Adam. We used to be in the flesh, but now we're living in spirit. Spiritual warfare is very, uh, very, very real, and we're called to fight the good fight. When we are saved, we're made right with God, and our identity is in Him. Therefore, we can live in the rhythms of His righteousness. With our standing being a heavenly identity, so is our reward for the things that we do in this life. It's a, it's a matter of heavenly inheritance. So how do we become this vessel of honor? It sounds good. 
But how do we get there? The Bible depicts the process of becoming a vessel of honor in a similar way as we discussed earlier. The way to do it is to purge impurities. Just like as this metal is heated up and the good things is left behind, you become a better product, you take those impurities and you just throw them out. And when you do this, the Bible says that we become more vessels of gold instead of vessels of mud, dirt, earth. So we just done by purging impurities and following after things like righteousness. We're told to walk by faith, not by sight. To live in charity, pursue charity, peace, and purity over, over, over all things. So if y'all would turn with me to 2 uh, Timothy 2.20-22. It says, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of, uh, also of wood and of earth, and some to honor, and some uh, to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared for every good work. The amazing thing is, um, I, I used to hear the story of the prodigal child explain that it wasn't fair that you know, uh, one person that just returned to Christ uh, was able to go to heaven, and this, uh, the other brother who stayed and did the work of the master um, went to heaven as well. I heard the story used to be told, uh, told that way. And in a way, I think that's a good illustration here. When we get to heaven, there's going to be different kinds of vessels. Well, everybody being a glorified body, but for a heavenly reward, we'll have vessels, some people vessels of mud, some people vessels of gold. Our pursuit is to live as a vessel of Gold, of honor as we go. So, in the way I like to think of it, I like to think of this as a Christian alloy in a sense. When we talk about alloys, you have copper, uh, copper, I mean bronze is made out of copper and tin. Brass is made out of copper and zinc. What should the Christian be composed of? Holy Spirit and Scripture. That's, uh, that's the strongest combination that you can have um, for use. Unbreakable. The result is, as we pour more scripture into our lives, and uh, we're leading to what God will have for us, that you abound, that you have overflow, and others will abound around you. Remember, comforting people, people that can comfort, are comforting people. We're comforted by the Holy Spirit and the scripture that he set before us. So as we experience God's grace, his peace and joy more and more, we are to abound and develop something that um, therapists often call a non-anxious presence. Um, I love that word. Uh, as we go around people, people see that we have been comforted ourselves and they can um, relate and associate with us. So, people will, so will associate you more and more as you experience the peace of God. But first, we must separate ourselves uh, from things that cause decrease. Uh, here in Thessalonians, we have some very physical examples. Fornication, deceit, those two things that would cause you to decrease um, uh, spiritually. But we're supposed to cling to the things that are good. If y'all would, turn to me, uh, turn with me uh, in Philippians 4.8. It is page 578. Now, if you'd like a practical verse of, of what to cling to, I think Philippians 4.8 is one of the best examples. Taken our life. It says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be of any praise, think on these things. We continue on, and it, it gets even better. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So if you want uh, an example of something to cling to, cling to those things which are good. Cling to those things which are honest. Cling to things that are just, pure, lovely, and so on. 
The will of God is to abstain from evil and cling to his holiness. I have two more verses for this point and we'll move on. Um, you ever just turn over to 1 Thessalonians 5.22? And you'll find a really easy me uh, memory verse. First Thessalonians 5.22 and our Bible is 5. <laughs> easy to remember, I promise. <laughs> Abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from evil. Cling to holiness. And you'll find a similar verse in Psalms 101.3 if you're taking um, notes. So first... We're talking about walking in the will of God. The will of God is that we live unto holiness. Next, walking in the love of God. We're going to go to 1 Thessalonians 4, 8-12, which we've already read, but I'm going to recap it. He says, He, he therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, yeah, despiseth not man, but God, who has given us unto his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. For you yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed you do it towards all brethren, which are in uh, all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and to study to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your hands and as we command you, that ye may walk honestly towards them that are without and that ye may have uh, lacking nothing. Godly comfort that was God is born out of the love that we learn from God. Comfort is born out of love, and love we learn from God as a model. Government, Hollywood, society is trying real hard, but it does not get to decide what love is. God has set not the uh, not only the standard of what love is, the definition of standard, but He also set the example in His Son Jesus Christ. And um, as we move forward. The lines have become blurred for many in society of what love is. So one of all, for these three entities above, government, Hollywood, society, that's just some of the ones that I've listed. It really it, it does not mesh well with God's definition of love as it should. So the lines have become blurred. And we know that God does not change, Hebrews 13.8. How he operates uh, may, let me put that out there, have Isaiah 43.19, Behold, I'm going to do a new thing. Or Romans 8, 1, there is now, therefore, no condemnation in Jesus Christ. When we use that word now, that means that before, there was condemnation. Mm -hmm. But God's character never changes. His attributes, therefore, he will, he will always possess holy love. And he will always be the example. Always, always some of the attributes that um, he will always have, some examples... He's always all-knowing. He's always all-good. He's always righteous. He's always holy. And he's always loving. Now the catch to this is, if he is love, in Romans 8.28 we have the verse, God works all things to the good of those who love him and call according to his purpose. You go on, and it says that uh, we're called to be conformed to his image. If God is love, what are we to look like? Love. God is spirit, and we are to live in spirit, not, uh, not the flesh. Uh, if y'all would, turn with me uh, to Romans 8 9. And that's page 555. It says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he has none of his. We're identifying with God, we need to identify with his love as well. So, as we're conformed to his image, and image as an attribute, once again we find ourselves with contrast. You have the flesh that you're living in, it doesn't know godly love. Let's step across this line. Live in the spirit. We know God in love. Therefore, we should also desire to dispense the love that he gave us as well. Possess your vessel, study his word, and live according to his word. 
a practical way to do this. I, I love going for these practical verses. Galatians 5.16. It says to walk by the Spirit so that what? So that we don't gratify the desires of the flesh. Fight the good fight that stands between spirit and flesh. All of my life, I've heard that love is a choice. And I'm not disagreeing with that. But I believe it's only partly true. Because love should also precede the choices that we make. It should be in the sinews of the choices that we make. It must be more than something that we do each day. Love needs to be the motivation and the catalyst for our decisions and actions. We can go to the most popular verse uh, probably in the Bible, John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world, what did he do? He made a choice that he gave his only begotten son. It wasn't choice. His, the love preceded it, and the love went with the choice. In fact, the Bible says God is love. If love is simply a choice, then wouldn't that just make God a, cho a choice? By some definition, he would be uh, nothing more than a choice, but we know that's not true. Why is this? Because every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that he is God. It don't sound like a choice in the end. <laughs> Love is more so than uh, love is more so this moral, righteous principle of goodwill that God has for His creation to us. And the Bible, a lot of times, is referred to as a God they love. We now, who are possessed in the Spirit of God, can live by His example of love and pursue this righteous goodwill and catch this untransactional affection for all of humanity. We don't deserve His love. We don't deserve His grace, but He gave it to us anyway. Why? Well, it goes back to it. He loves us. It. It's untransactional. Um, there's a quote by a pastor named Alistair Bay that uh, I wrote down at one point. I, I enjoyed it. It says, There is no one who is insignificant in the purpose of God. He loves uh, each and every person on this earth. So let us see others this way and pursue the love that uh, pursues us. Lastly, so we have walking in the will of God. We have walking in the love of God. Now, I want to discuss walking in God's timeline. Very important. There's many places I could have t uh, taken this. And uh, here we'll see a little bit about the end times. I'm, not gonna, I'm going to discuss uh, some of the uh, end time theology here, but I want to discuss more so um, another aspect of this. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18. That is page 581. And I promise we'll discuss these, um, we'll discuss the rapture and all the inside stuff more in depth soon. Um, I do not have enough time today to get everything that I'd like to say about that. <laughs> so, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which uh, are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Catch that. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also uh, also which sleep in Jesus will bring God with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Catch us. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. These misconceptions that the Thessalonian church had uh, as to death and their future, it paralyzed them, as so it will us. If you don't understand where you're going, life, it, 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 it's hard to keep going in um, the way that we're supposed to. They had sorrow. They were paralyzed with it. There is uncertainty about the fate of past Christians, of past loved ones, of past family members. That's a scary reality, uh, thinking about the eternal destination of our loved ones. It was paralyzed in this church. So Paul alleviated and he comforted this fear by informing them of what? God's divine plan for the future. He said, that, uh, those that believe are secure with Christ, and at Christ's return in the rapture, they will be secure as well. And what, is it, what was the result of this? They were comforted. They had hope. Not only did they know that their family is taken care of, they know that one day 
uh, they'll make it to the pearly gates as well. If that misconception, if that misconception continued, the Thessalonian church would not be affected. I, you know, um, you could call that speculation, but I know it's true. The uh, Thessalonian church would not be affected if they lost their hope. Not only would they be hopeless, but this pursuit of holiness that they have would have dwindled. Um, because without the promise of heaven in the future, this would imply that their labor is in vain. It's always a question, what am I doing this for? Um, I, I, I've worked a few jobs before, and I'm always, I've worked out in the heat before, and I'm always wondering, what am I out here for? You, know, <laughs> you kind of lose, you lose track of what you're doing because you don't know where you're going. But Paul was sure uh, in a, another church, the Corinthian church, in the same way. If y'all would, turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 15 to 58. I'll beat y'all there, I'll get y'all page number. Uh, five, six, six. I'm going to read 50 through 58, but I'm going to focus on verse 57 and 58. Uh, now I say, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither uh, do the corruption inherit corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, I see where this is going, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That sounds very promising. For this corruptible must put on incorrupt, uh, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought the past the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. That's another sermon for later. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much we know that the labor is not in vain in the Lord. He gave them something to look forward to. And then he says, because of this, um, it says, therefore, be steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding. Because we know that the victory is already won in Jesus Christ. We have a, a heavenly reward waiting for us to be steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding. Once again, abounding means overflowing, overflowing in the love, the hope, peace, joy of Jesus Christ himself. And live steadily in that overflow. Living on God's timeline and understanding His goodness to us gives us hope that we can carry out His will and love to those around us. Um, before I get to the conclusion, I'd like to close with one more verse, and I promise we'll, uh, we'll close down a little bit. Romans 5, 5 through 11. Page five five four. All right, starting at verse five, it says, "And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die." But God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Going back to what we were talking about right there. Mm -hmm. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of sin, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now received atonement. Lastly, I would just like to give a call. A call to walk in the will of God. To walk in the love of God. And to remain hopeful walking in His timeline. Next week, we'll be discussing the expected reaction as we live this life. And uh, for God's grace to us. As we know to rejoice, pray, and be thankful to Him. And thank you 
uh, for joining with us today uh, to a live audience. Uh, I pray that you'll join us next week. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, just reach out to us through our site, social media, whatever it be. Thank you.